Coming up, Super Size versus Super Skinny goes deep to examine the reasons behind dangerous eating behavior. We hear from an obese American for whom every day is a living hell. Don't wait until it's too late because you'll die. The recovery course for our anorexics gets tougher than ever. That's not enough for lunch. Anna Richardson's quest for the body beautiful reaches the bottom line. And in our feeding clinic, Super Size Scott, the midnight muncher. I just love food too much. <laughs> and Super Skinny Emma. Maybe I'm just a bit of a control freak. <laughs> will be swapping diets for five days. And Dr. Christian Jessen will be forcing them to confront the causes of their extreme eating. It's no longer about what you're eating. It's now about what's eating you. Over the next five days, two fanatical foodies from opposite ends of the weight spectrum will come together in the feeding clinic to confront their eating habits head on. Entering the diet den this week are Scott, the unstoppable eating machine. I'm quite a big fan of meatballs. And health freak Emma. Last night, I really didn't like what I had, so... It doesn't matter. Eat the damn stuff. And there'll be no place to hide as Dr. Christian ensures they face up to the real reasons behind their disastrous diets. It's shocking. 38-year-old Emma is so obsessed with healthy eating that she's actually wasting away. When looking in the mirror, I, kind of, I guess I just see a stick insect, really. Just something really thin, thin arms, thin legs. I don't really like what I see. As a full-time mum, life is a constant whirlwind. I'm getting all dizzy. But Emma has a strict discipline policy on her diet. I think food is probably something I control where everything around me is chaotic. Emma will spend the next five days in the feeding clinic. She's already had a full medical to ensure she's up to the challenge. 163 centimetres tall. The minimum healthy weight for a woman of five foot four is about seven stone ten pounds. 85 pounds. Emma barely tickles the scales at six stone one, which means she's nearly two stone underweight. So, Emma, your BMI actually was even lower than I imagined. It's 14.5, which is alarmingly low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is almost ill BMI, mm -hmm. because being at this weight will absolutely lead you to a very, very high risk of osteoporosis. Um, I think my diet's just really healthy. Um, there's not an awful lot of... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your diet's really healthy. Yeah. Why is your BMI 14.5 if you're on a healthy diet? 38-year-old Emma's got an unhealthy obsession with healthy food. She is very, very self-conscious about the food that she eats. Probably a routine that needs to be cracked, really, if she's going to put the weight on. I don't know what stops me. I suppose I'm just set in my ways and I've, I just do the same thing. I suppose it's quite controlled, really. Maybe I'm just a bit of a control freak. <laughs> Emma needs a big helping hand when it comes to letting go of control over her diet. And we've got just the man for the job, her supersize opponent, Scott. For 23-year-old record shop assistant Scott, food is the soundtrack to his life. He just doesn't know when to stop. I definitely love food. Um, I've been brought up to enjoy food, so I always enjoy what I eat, um, which is probably my downfall as well. <laughs> Mm, 388 pounds. At 27 and a half stone, Scott weighs nearly five times more than Elfin Emma. You are off my scale, Scott. And his whacking great waistline of 63 inches is a frightening 40 inches bigger than Emma's. Because I enjoy food so much, I eat quite a lot of it and don't think about the consequences right now. Scott gorges himself on pasties, pastries and crisps. And that's just lunch. For dinner, one of my favourite meals is um, meatballs, and we just end up having around about 20, 25 of them at a time. But even after a meatball bonanza, Scott isn't ready to call it a day. In the morning, you come down and see all the, the dirty dishes you need been up helping themselves. Usually at night time, when I'm snacking after my dinner, I can end up going through about four or five bags of crisps, half a packet, maybe a full packet of biscuits, a couple of bars of chocolate or something. 
Scott's unstoppable midnight munching has left him with a monster-sized BMI of 58, meaning he is morbidly obese. Are you worried about the health side of things? Yeah, definitely. My dad and my granddad as well developed diabetes, high blood pressure and things like that, and the fact that I'm only 23 and a bit worrying. <laughs> If you're the size that you are, it's going to be very, very hard to treat your high blood pressure, and that will lead to heart attack. And Scott's weight puts a strain on his heart in another way, too. I feel that my weight affects relationships because people see me and they don't really see me as the buff looking guy, and um, they see me as, oh, there's that fat guy in the corner type thing. There might be a 21 stone weight difference between them. But by swapping diets for five days, our two opponents will learn valuable lessons from each other as they're forced to confront their own distorted attitudes to food. The waiting's over. It's time for Super Size to meet Super Skinny. <laughs> How are you? Scott. What's your name? Scott. Scott and Emma. Awesome. Scott and Emma have provided detailed food diaries, and to get to the guts of their diet problems, Christian's going to show them exactly what a week's worth of each other's food looks like. All right, Emma, we're going to start with you, and we're going to start with your breakfast. Let's have a look what you tend to eat for breakfast. Cereal with some fruit and toast as well. So does this make up a whole breakfast? Yeah. Cereal and toast? No, it's not, is it? No, don't fib to me, Emma. All right, so you're going to call out already. Tell me your breakfast, really. Um, either or, either it's cereal or toast. This is the start of your portion control, isn't it? It's always either or or something. Let's go on to lunches. Maybe they get a bit better. Here we go. Is, is, is that all you would have for a lunch? It would be a bagel or a pit of bread? Yeah. And that's it? Yeah. Nothing more? No. How do they compare to yours, do you think? Uh, I think they're quite small compared to me. Yeah. OK, well, let's go on to dinners. Pasta or vegetables? Looks like some potato. So you're pretty convinced you're eating a healthy diet aren't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would it surprise you if I told you that this diet is actually deficient in pretty much all of the basic minerals that you need to be healthy? Yes. An average woman needs 2,000 calories a day. Emma's taking in just 1,500 calories. That's a weekly under-eat of two days. While Emma digests that bad news about her diet, it's time for Scott's Mighty Meals to come under scrutiny. So, Scott, we're going to start with your breakfast. Here we go. <laughs> Where are they, Scott? Non-existent, unfortunately. <laughs> not one day do you eat breakfast? No, not at all. OK, let's hope, then, that there are some lunches. I think there might be. They've got to be. Whoa, OK. <laughs> there's sausage rolls, there's pasties. This is the point about not eating breakfasts, because you're hungry, aren't you? and your body is craving instant fix, sugary, fatty foods that are going to give you lots of energy. It's not a good thing to do, even if you're trying to lose weight. OK, let's move on to dinners. Pasta, meatballs. Is that one sitting, those meatballs? Um, yeah, that would be about one sitting. The really shocking thing is that that's not it for Scott. Shall we have a look at Scott's snacks? You cannot possibly be hungry after dinner whilst you're snacking, can you? There's something else going on. Is it habit? Is it loneliness? Is it boredom? Think about it this week. Do you really need to be doing this? Because I suggest that you really don't. <laughs> An average man needs 2,500 calories a day. Scott is getting through a jaw-dropping 4,250. That's a weekly overeat of nearly five days. So, from this point, you are officially now diet swapped. Your next meal will be each other's meals. Best of luck to you. Coming up, Anna Richardson gets to the bottom of what it takes to have bootalicious buttocks. And in the diet den, Scott's lunch is a fat fest too far for health freak Emma. She's having a laugh. That's enough for, that's for, yeah, enough for about it. four people. Let's face it, we're all obsessed with our bodies, weight and food. I'm Anna Richardson, and even though I've lost two stone in two years, I'm still not happy with how I look. All I see is imperfection. I've become totally hooked on getting the body beautiful, and if there's an easy, quick fix like Botox or teeth whitening, believe me, I'm up for it. But I've also signed up with a personal trainer to give my body the kickstart it needs and tackle my problem areas. 
One of my biggest bugbears is my bum. It's totally flat, so it'd be quite nice, maybe just to lift it a little bit. Do you know, just a bit. You know, I'm thinking J-Lo, Beyonce. Do you know what I mean? Just a little bit of a curve. Now, I know I haven't got it, but what does the perfect derriere look like? Time to ask the great British public. What do you think makes the perfect bottom? Nicely rounded. I think fairly firm, but, st but still soft. I'd definitely say peachy. You've got to have a peach. Imagine a lady's bottom. Look at that backside! <laughs> How, does my bum look all right? It looks, it looks wonderful, isn't it? Oh, what a rotten liar. I know I've got a long way to go to achieve Kylie styly levels of peachiness, so I'd better get to work. Now, I wouldn't exactly call my relationship with the gym a love affair. I hate the gym. But I'm back down the hellhole to work on my glutes. That's the technical term for your bum. Squats are apparently regarded as the best exercise to work your bottom. They also work your thighs. And they hurt. Ow. Good. Feel the bum burn. And Matt's finishing me off with the bum bridge. Ow. How's that? <sighs> How did it look? This whole gym thing is turning into a nightmare. Now, I can guarantee that if women are unhappy with a part of their body these days, then somebody will have come up with a treatment that claims to fix it. I'm going to find out what's involved in a brand new instant bum plumping procedure. Dr. Richardson, at your disposal. Bend over, you will not feel a thing. Macrolane injections are a naturally degradable gel and they've been used to fill out boobs, calves, and yes, even penises. Now they're being used to boost bums as well. Hi, Lisa, all right? I'm being allowed to watch as 33 year old mum Lisa Turner gets jabbed. It's a good job I'm not squeamish, isn't it? <laughs> After a local anaesthetic, Dr. Ayubi sets about injecting the gel under Lisa's skin, just above the muscle. The gel is made from hyaluronic acid, which is a fluid found naturally in the skin, joints, and eyes. Uh, so, but you're not in pain, Lisa? No, not at all. There's no pain. Sometimes it feels a little bit stingy. Time to plump up the volume on buttock number two. Got to tell you, Lisa, from, from here, <laughs> you're looking fabulous. I'm looking, Anna. The Macrolane injections start from £2,500 and they aren't a permanent solution. Lisa's new bum will last between 12 to 18 months before the gel disintegrates. OK. Wow! Yeah! It is definitely, definitely peachier. Lisa seems happy, but the injections can have side effects, including redness and soreness. I do think, actually, that that is, you know, the perfect quick fix. That took maybe half an hour. She has got, you know, a really great bum. I know mine is sagging a bit, but it's definitely not for me. I've said no to big scary needles, but later I meet a woman who spent £500,000 getting the perfect body, and that includes doing it DIY. Oh, it's all the way in. You're mad. This week's feeding clinic residents are Scott and Emma. And once they've settled in, they get their first chance to sample each other's diet with a typical dinner. So for Scott, it's a jacket potato with cauliflower cheese. And for Emma, it's chips with 20 of Scott's famous meatballs. It might be the first vegetable Scott's seen in a while, but it's not a happy reunion. Not a huge fan of cauliflower. I'm not a huge fan of meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the, the vegetables that I really don't like. Kind of makes me feel sick if I have a couple of bits of it, to be honest. While Emma ploughs on, Scott throws in the towel. <laughs> I think I will have to leave it because I just I don't think I could face another bit. <laughs> But after bringing her total to 17 meatballs, Emma finally admits defeat. Nothing else. I'm done. No. Emma's calling it a night, but little does she know it's actually time for a snack attack. Some chocolate cakes and crisps. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Oh, God. I can contemplate one chocolate bar, but crisps as well. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. The next day. 
And lunch for Emma is a jumbo-sized junk fest. I see what you mean when you said you have a big lunch. To tackle Emma's health freak tendencies and portion size phobia, she must try and eat everything in front of her. So she's having a laugh. That's, not for, that's for, <laughs> enough for about it. four people. <laughs> but as Scott tucks into his solitary tuna sweet corn sandwich and breadsticks, you know, God. <laughs> Emma decides she's not playing by the diet swap rules. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's not necessarily the, con the quantity, it's the content, because it all just tastes the same on the plate. Yeah. I don't like being restricted. I just want what I want. Do you know what I mean? Emma's over-the-top control of food probably had a specific trigger point, so she and Scott delve into the past to try and find where their food issues began. This is me at uh, 20. I was right. on holiday with a group of friends. You definitely look much more fuller there. Yeah. Uh, and there's a bit of a difference between the, these two as well. Yeah. That was a couple of months after I got made redundant. Right. I think. So I take it the redundancy did hit quite hard then? In yeah. Terms of things like that, like, yeah. It's really hard. I remember being quite down about it and stressed. So that's probably where my smaller and smaller portions came from. Right. I just didn't feel like eating because I was stressed out. I think looking at the photos was really useful. I think emotionally I lost the sort of routine, the nine to five routine of not having a job and there didn't seem to be not much of an element of control in my life. So maybe I introduced that by controlling my food. I think it kind of spiraled a bit out of control from there really. So were you quite into your food from like a really young age then? Yeah, mum and dad made sure of that, that I was always one that enjoyed and appreciated the food that I had and was never really brought up on anything. Crap. So what, what happened between then and there then? I was working at a, a supermarket on the tills and the fact that you're putting through all the all the stuff, you're seeing all the special deals going on and you're like, oh, I'll just, I'll buy that, that looks quite good, oh, I'll buy that, it's really cheap. And I get outside of work and I'm like, if I take this home, my mum and dad are going to kill me, so I better eat it now. And I'd end up eating most of it there and then. And I think that's what kind of triggered the whole snacking to the excess. So... Do, do you think it's because your parents had kept you under quite a tight rein and didn't let you have, like, any rubbishy, junky-type food that when you suddenly re realised that you can, you went the other way because you'd never been had it, you'd always been denied it? Yeah, I'd never actually really thought like that before, that it could have been the fact that I had more time to myself, that I would try and fit in as much stuff that mum and dad would not agree on. We've touched on things that I've never really thought of before. I think it has helped quite a bit to see where it started and how it's gotten to the point it's at now. Scott's turned a vital corner in understanding the emotional triggers that have led to his overeating, and Christian wants to show him what can happen if he doesn't take control now. Come on in, have a seat with me. With at least 400 million obese people in the world, Glasgow boy Scott is not alone. And Scotland may have the second highest rate of obesity in the developed world, but one nation is still the unbeaten heavyweight champion, and that's the good old US of A. In this series, we've been following eight morbidly obese Americans who are offering a lifeline to our supersizers by sharing their experiences. Difficult start to the morning when I wake up. Excruciating pain in my joints. In the creases, you sweat. It is the most ungodly smell. I have a problem with putting my shoes on. I almost hyperventilate. It's now too late to ever undo the damage they've done to themselves, but they hope to inspire our supersizers to take action. So I've got something I want you to watch. Yep. Okay. 46-year-old Kenny from Oregon weighs 37 stone and needs a cocktail of drugs to stay alive. He has a message for Scott. Being as large I am and having the obesity problem, it's caused a great number of regrets for me, for the fact that I cannot have activities with my children, that I have uh, three grandchildren now. It's one of my biggest loves is skiing, and I so badly want to teach my children, my son, uh, to ski and to be able to go with them. He's now interested in snowboarding, and he's done pretty good on his own. But I have to sit at the lodge and watch him come down the hill. I can't go with him. Elizabeth, can you help me? I 
need a lot of assistance doing um, routine activities that a lot of people take for granted. My esteem is so low, I, it just makes me feel you know, less than uh, a person than I, I could be or that I want to be. Because of my obesity, uh, I started having some serious health issues. Um, I have high blood pressure I have to take medication for. Um, the extra weight on my body has affected my joints in such a way that I'm just filled with arthritis. And I had a pulmonary embolism uh, in January of 2008, which I was hospitalized for. One thing leads to another with the obesity to the point where now I'm on so much medication and that I can't really do anything on my own without getting assistance. A message I would like to send out is that the weight problem, the obesity problem, isn't something that you have to fix on your own. Find the courage to ask for help and to get the help you need because you don't want to suffer and miss out on the opportunities that life has to offer. You know, don't wait until it's too late because if you don't, you'll die. Did you see any sort of parallels, things that you're feeling or suffering from that he talked about? He wanted to be able to teach his kids, like skiing and snowboarding and that, but he's got to watch them from the, from the cabin. Same thing as me, to have to watch my mates go snowboarding. The fact that I can't join in with them is something I'd love to do. Mm. Do you think this will have an effect? Just seeing someone like that. And the problems that he's got now because he's uh, not done anything about it. Yeah, it's sinking in there. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Yeah. All right, well done, Scott. Awesome. Kenny's message has given Scott a major wake-up call. He's always wanted to go snowboarding, but felt too shy of his weight. Now he hits the slopes for the first time ever with keen skier Emma. I can get up, hop you up and then... So it just yeah. nice and balanced to the bottom. Oh. <laughs> <Whee>! <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, it was going. It was going. You just can't keep a good man down and Scott straight up the hill for more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. I always thought I had to terrible balance but it's not too bad and it's been brilliant I'm kind of gutted I've left it till now to start doing this I'm looking forward to doing it again no it's good brilliant <laughs> starting to be honest knackered after that <laughs> many overweight people feel embarrassed about exercising but as well as all the physical benefits the hormones and chemicals released during exercise have been shown to reduce anxiety stress and depression improving mood and self-esteem, which can lead to eating less. In other words, exercise can help make you feel happy, eat less and lose weight. This is yours for today. Thank you. <laughs> but Scott's mood's about to take a turn for the worse. Not only is his apres ski lunch no more than a cheese salad bagel... Not a huge fan of a uh, tomato, but... You can take them out. I think today I couldn't kill this. <laughs> but Emma, who's faced with another feast of prawn roll, pasties, crisps and chocolate, is once again attempting to dodge the stodge. Can't face pasties today. No, not no. even one. Mm -mm. She's had no breakfast and she's getting a big lunch, but she's not eating it because it's something that she's not too fond of. Whereas, I mean, I know personally I've been eating things that I'm not fond of. Sure, you don't want to try the, the pasties because you're so hungry. No way. The pasties, um, I'm afraid, I failed miserably. Big chunks of meat inside a pasty. Mm -mm. Can't handle that, I'm afraid. The fact that she's not tried is a bit uh, annoying. Coming up, our anorexia sufferers are finding it tough at the buffet. It's tough to eat this, I must yeah. admit. Uh -huh. This is really tough. And Christian confronts Emma with some home truths. It's, it's difficult. Though. Like last night, I really didn't like what I had. So it doesn't matter. Eat the damn stuff.
Supersize Scott and Super Skinny Emma are three days into their diet swap. But Emma's rejection of Scott's food is starting to get on his nerves. I don't really like white bread either. No? No. Nah. It's like brown. And it just tastes really eggy. Like it's got about ten eggs in it. Yeah. No, I don't like the taste. The whole reason we're doing this is to swap our diets, basically, and see what the other eats. But she's still controlling what she's eating. I feel a bit despondent, because it wasn't the stuff that I liked. Just something nice and fresh. <laughs> Emma's poor attempts to keep to her side of the diet swap have got alarm bells ringing for Christian. Her refusal to eat Scott's food is worrying, as it shows she's struggling to let go of her controlling eating habits. Christian steps in. How's the food going? How's the eating going? It's not bad. I think I did pretty well on Monday. I managed to eat 17 meatballs in one sitting. Which I heard, which was good, good, and I thought, great, OK, we're starting off well, and then what's happened? But the other stuff we've been having, I really haven't liked, mm. especially last night. I, a, I wasn't hungry, and B, I really didn't like it. So it's really hard to shovel down stuff that you don't like. Mm. You're still rigidly clinging on to your control. And do you remember I said to you day one, you need to start to relax? There's always sort of an excuse, a, a reason. It's, it's difficult, though. like last night, I really didn't like what I had, so... It doesn't yeah. matter. Eat the damn stuff. It will do you good. In the last 10 years, doctors have seen a huge increase in the number of people whose obsession with eating healthy food has led to them being severely underweight and malnourished. A fixation with healthy eating can actually be dangerous, and if left unchecked, can become a serious eating disorder. Hey, come on and have a seat. Christian's message hasn't hit home with Emma yet, so he asks her to look at some stark images of herself to understand the damage her diet has done. So tell me your thoughts looking at you now. It's very bony, the old wrinkly skin, old. You keep saying old, which is interesting. Yeah. Is that something that plays on your mind? No, not really. You're I just, just didn't it, think you? that my skin looked that bad. And from a medical point of view, looking at your skin, yeah, I would agree with you. I think it is slightly damaged and mm. aged more than I would expect. Your diet, to an extent, can help protect that. Mm -hmm. Minerals like selenium and zinc are really, really important in mopping up those free radicals. You, as you now know, are not getting enough of those things in your diet. In fact, you're deficient in them. And I think that would explain why it's more apparent. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things is that you're in control of all this. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. You know, all you have to do is eat more. I always thought I had um, a really healthy diet, so I always thought I was getting all the right nutrients and minerals and vitamins, but... Um, yeah, it's quite shocking when you find otherwise. You think you've been doing it right all along and you haven't, and it's a bit of shock. It's the last supper in the feeding clinic, and Emma's got just one more chance to eat what's put in front of her. So how are you feeling, last meal? Oh, I can't wait for it. Starving. <laughs> <laughs> can't wait, to be honest. Scott's getting a welcome feast of spaghetti bolognese and two whole squares of chocolate. Thank you and meatballs are back on the menu for Emma. Looks like Emma's finally turned the corner as she matches Scott, mouthful for mouthful. Last meatball. Go for that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Sure. <laughs> I got to eat well tonight. <laughs> now yeah. I've done it, finally. over 1.6 million people are battling with an eating disorder, and these figures are rising. Morag, Roz, Fiona and Ashley are anorexic. Over the series, we're following the group's progress as they take part in an eight-week course designed to challenge some of the key aspects of this destructive illness. Helping the group address their issues are two renowned eating disorder specialists, consultant psychiatrist Dr Peter Rowan and eating disorder dietitian Ursula Philpott. Anorexia is frequently associated with sufferers denying themselves food, but obsessive and excessive exercise is a common part of the illness. Our anorexia sufferers are now in the third week of treatment, 
and to help them break their abusive relationships with exercise, Ursula has arranged for the group to go salsa dancing, where the aim is to socialize, not to burn calories. OK, guys, we're going to start with the salsa basic steps today. So let's begin with the mambo basic step. Salsa dancing is great because the emphasis is on fun rather than burning up calories. One thing that they get out of exercising is the distraction from thoughts of, about food and weight. And if I can replace that with something healthy like salsa dancing, that's got to be a good thing. Don't straighten the legs so much, Fena. Okay. You, and you must flex the legs a little bit. Okay. Yes? As a trained maths teacher, Fiona applies her mathematical brain to her exercise routine. There was a time when I was doing as much as three or four hours of walking a day. At one point, I had a pedometer and I could count how many steps I'd actually done. And I read in a magazine somewhere that you had to do over 10,000 steps. And so that became another of my rules. I had to walk 10,000 steps at least every day. For the anorexic, the tendency is to use the same form of exercise, count it rigidly, do exactly the same thing repetitively, and do it again and again and again. One, two, that's better. Close body contact is a new experience for Fiona, as she's never had a relationship. I'm aware that, you know, I'm now at 25 years old and I've got absolutely no experience whatsoever. Will other people ever find me attractive? It's just a big question because it's the unknown. And open and close and down. <laughs> At just over five stone, Roz is the lightest of the group and has become dependent on her rigid daily activity. Compulsive exercising at very low weights can be extremely damaging, resulting in stress fractures, osteoporosis, and heart problems, and in extreme cases, can be fatal. We all of us use exercise in appropriate ways. We regard it as a normal way of trying to keep a healthy body. The problem for the anorexic is that they do exactly the same thing, except that they do it to extreme. They have a conflict. That conflict is between wanting to eat and at the same time being terrified of the consequence of that, which of course is weight gain. And the difficulty with that is that they become compulsive about it. If I don't do it, I get really... I'm a nightmare to be around. The illness changes people. It seems that other things in their life are a bit of a distraction. It makes them different people from, from what they used to be, it actually becomes very difficult not to blame the person for what you're feeling towards the illness. And one, two, three, and five, six, seven. Before anorexia, Ashley used to enjoy exercising with his team at football training. But a wrist injury put an end to his dreams of becoming a footballer. There was a time when I was doing a lot of exercise, gym work, football, and then when that stopped, there was a hole, and I needed to fill that hole. As he began to lose weight, he became too weak to do his usual training, so has taken walking to the extreme. I'll often walk four or five miles a day and just try and walk as much as I can and make as many excuses as I can to walk. There's always an excuse for going other than the real reason, but we know the reason he's going. I'm trying to earn what I eat to make it more comfortable for myself, to justify that toast, to justify the tuna salad in the evening, to justify the bit of fruit I've had at lunchtime. There always needs to be that justification in my head, and the way around that is by walking. And shoulders. And shoulders, Fiona. <laughs> Morag uses walking to burn off her unwanted calories. Even in the most bizarre circumstances, I'll find an excuse to get out for a walk somewhere, or I'll just get up really early in the morning, or I'll wait till really late at night, it doesn't matter. Exercise is, is the thing that, that helps me sort of feel in control of things. Together, and together, one. And close, oh. and down. <laughs> Once I got over my initial nerves and just kind of relaxed into the music, 
I really had a good time. I do know there are places in Leeds where you can do salsa dancing, and after that, I am kind of tempted to go up and see if there's anything that I could do, you know, meet people. It sounds like a good way of doing it. Yeah. I'm always thinking, oh, I look very skinny or horrible when okay, you're dancing, the, the mood just overtakes, and um, I don't really think about it anymore, which is rather nice. If I could find myself a partner, I can see myself going to salsa lessons. Can't see myself going on my own, but if I found myself a female partner, perhaps to take along. Maybe. Yeah, maybe I can see myself dosy doing around the dance floor. What's important about today's task is that everybody had fun. You know, people were laughing and smiling and joking. I'd really like to try and get them to take that and replicate that back in their everyday lives. They've all embraced today's lesson. But the fun soon ends as the group are faced with this week's food challenge. Today I've brought you for a buffet meal, uh, which is sort of tapas um, and lots and lots of small dishes to choose from, which I know is going to be quite challenging because of choosing the portions and deciding uh, which things to put on your plate. For anorexic sufferers, meals with no set portions are a huge challenge, as they're terrified of taking too much and overeating. Yeah, absolutely, there's plenty. You are constantly fearful of overeating, so therefore you take very small amounts, so you can be absolutely sure that you didn't overeat, and I think that just makes it more difficult. As the group makes their choices, Roz is really struggling with her selection. That's a very tiny amount. What's going to happen if you eat it? What I'd, I would say is you need to have a, I'd have a hunk of bread with that. That's not enough for a lunch. Just want to put some bread on. Yeah. It seems like everyone's relaxed a little bit now we've sat down to eat, but the process of choosing was pretty tense. I just think when there's so much choice, you don't know what to choose, and it's just a bit overwhelming. It is tough to eat this, I must yeah. admit. Uh -huh. This is really tough. You keep thinking, oh, God, the plate's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but then... I just keep reminding myself, no, I want this to be a normal portion. You don't trust that you can either A, put enough on, or B, put, you're going to put too much on, so you're kind of caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, and you're like, mm. it's just a really uncomfortable feeling. So I want you to feel unsafe, and I want you to feel out of control, and I want to help support you to, to manage that, to prove that you can, prove that you can, can do, do it, it, and nothing terrible will happen as a consequence. I get thinking, well, I'm not going to suddenly explode and die, you know, disappear off the face of the earth. It's just, it's just dinner. Next week, our anorexia sufferers tackle their body image by going clothes shopping. I felt I looked like a man should look. Now I kind of feel like I look like a little boy. And messages from home remind them why beating the illness is so vital. I really miss you. Love that. and her diet swapper, Scott, have come to the end of a long and eventful five days in our feeding clinic. Before he sends them on their way, Dr Jesson gives Emma and Scott their diet plans for the next 12 weeks. So, it's Friday, which means it's going home day for you guys, which I'm sure you're delighted about, aren't you? <laughs> what I want to do now is give you your diet plans for the next three months. Before I do that, let's have a look at old-style breakfast. <laughs> right. I mean, it may seem like crazy, but this is old-style Scott breakfast, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Of absolutely nothing. nothing. You never ate breakfast. And what happened? I have a massive lunch afterwards. <laughs> Orbity. Absolutely starving. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at what I think a breakfast should be. You've got whole grains in the cereal. Cereals are also fortified by the manufacturers. They'll have iron, they'll have minerals, they'll have vitamins in, things that you need. They're already added into that cereal. The whole grains are great for heart health, reducing risk of diabetes and cancers. Again, you know, fruit, a portion of your five a day is in there. Orange juice is great because not only is it a portion of your five a day, but also the vitamin C in it helps the absorption of iron from the cereals. So the two work together, which is why mixing things, what you used to do is have one thing or another thing, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of mixing lots of stuff together, but the importance of it is it actually helps everything, yeah? So let me give you your diet plans. Over here, Scott, that one is yours. And that's for you. And, you know, give it your best. Yeah, I think I will be changing my diet quite a bit. I think there'll be a lot more, a lot more fruit and salad in there and a lot less pastry. Awesome. Hope you do well. Me too. <laughs> See you later.
if I can eat big amounts of food that I don't like or food that I'm not really keen on, it'll be much easier doing it with stuff that I really like. Coming up, Anna gets to grips with a real-life Barbie. Can I feel your bum? Of course you can. That's where the implant is. And after three months on their new diet plans, Scott and Emma come face to face once again. I'm Anna Richardson, and I'm investigating what I can do to make my body beautiful. This week, I've been finding out what makes the perfect bottom. I know mine is sagging a bit, but it's definitely not for me. Whilst I admit to being obsessed with the way I look, I'm not alone. A staggering 44% of the UK population would consider going under the knife. And I'm about to meet a woman who's had over 500 procedures with not an end in sight. This was Sarah Burge, aged 26. And this is Sarah Burge today, aged 50, a mother of three who calls herself the real life Barbie. Sarah trained to do lots of her own treatments at home. In fact, she's going to show me how she zaps pesky wrinkles. So, this is my calcium hydroxy lapidate, derived from bones and teeth, a natural substance that is body degradable. Yeah. Oh, it's all the way in. When you look at yourself in the mirror, can you remember what you looked like when you were younger? Absolutely not. As Dolly Parton said, it takes a lot of money to look this cheap. Sarah's surgery and treatments over the years are worth a staggering £530,000. What have you had done? Well, everything, really. I mean, from my head to my toe, I've had uh, ear pin back at the age of seven. I've had a couple of facelifts, or two and a half to be exact. Okay. I've had cheek implants, chin implant. I've had upper and lower eyes done. The body, I've had a breast reduction. I've had liposuction, all various areas of the body. And my butt has been stuffed. Really? You've got bum implants? Bum implants, yeah. So totally addictive. I mean, once you see the benefits of having something done and the improvement that you can achieve, then you think, oh, what if I do this? What if I do that? Would you have anything else done? Oh, yeah. i just, just keep on going. Keep on going until you're... dead? A de <laughs> well, almost dead, yes. <laughs> There's just one crucial thing I need to ask before I leave. Can I feel your bum? Of course you can. <laughs> Go on. Oh, can you can you feel that? Yeah, of course I can is feel that, it. Which bit is that? The implant? It's totally plastic, you know. I just can't work. That's where the implant is. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> that is ex <laughs> quite nice in a strange so way. Sad. I've had a long, hard think about our Sarah, and I've come to the conclusion that when I was chatting to her, I kind of got swept along by her addiction to surgery and thought, yeah, you know, good for you, you look great. But actually, on reflection, I'm now thinking, is it really that good an idea to look like Barbie in your 50s? And thinking about what she's put her body through, I'm now thinking, actually, plastic really ain't that fantastic. <laughs> Three months ago, Scott and Emma entered the feeding clinic, and now they're back. But have they managed to turn their disastrous diets around? I really hate the way I'm showing my hard work, because I've, I've tried really, really hard. I don't know, to be honest, how much I think I've lost. I could maybe say that about a stone or something, but I'm really not too sure. Emma, how have you been? Really good, thank you. So what are the main changes that you've made? Um, I'm definitely a lot less controlling on food. Having more snacks, um, trying to snack like three times a day and just enjoying it more, I guess. And are you? Yes. You are. <laughs> Do you think you've made the sort of progress that you'd hoped to make? I'm not feeling as cold all the time and I've got, I think I've got more energy, so... You do? You feel better, do you? Do you feel healthy? Definitely feel better. So, Scott, it's nice to see you again 12 weeks later. How's it been? It's been really good, yeah. I've um, been enjoying doing the, the diet and it's going really well for me. So no more pasties? Nope. No? <laughs> and your sort of 25 meatball mega meals? <laughs> they are gone. A, a thing of history. Really? <laughs> and you're happy with that? Yes. Has it changed the way you think about food? It has indeed, yeah. It really has. I don't think, right, I'm hungry, I'm going to go and get 
a bag of crisps or anything, it's like, right, I'll go and grab an apple and a couple of oranges. Before Christian breaks the news, it's time for Scott and Emma to be reunited. Hey. <laughs> how are you hey. doing? I'm good, how are you? Good. Awesome. Good to see you, you again. Well. Cheers. <laughs> how have you been finding it? Not too bad. How about you? Yeah, it's been good, yeah. 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 Looking awesome. <laughs> Did you get snow up where you are? Yeah. Hello, hello. I'm coming in to say hello, hello. to you. <laughs> so, what do you think of him? Good. <laughs> A new man? Good, yeah, definitely. Are you surprised? Yeah, yeah. You were? Did you expect him to look... I mean, to me, he looks very, very different. He does look different. Does he look different to you? Yeah. Did you expect that, or were you kind of thinking he's not going to do it? <laughs> I don't know. He did really well in the house. I was just hoping that he didn't slip back into bad ways, but definitely, yes, I like notice it in the face, I think, more, more than anything. You think he's definitely lost weight? Yeah. Yeah? Definitely. Convinced? Yep. I'm going to tell you in a minute. <laughs> so what's your favorite? And what about with Eminem? I know you're looking so much healthier. It's, it's brilliant. You look brilliant. Definitely. So have the last three months all been worth it? How do you think you've done? I don't know. Half a stone? Half a stone? Maybe. A bit more. Well, I'll put you out of your misery. Quite a lot more than half a stone. You've gained 11 pounds. <laughs> and you've put on three inches around your middle. Three? Three inches. Yeah. Happy? Yes. I'm yes? Happy. Yep. That's pretty good, I have to say. So, Scott, what about you? 11 pounds weight loss or a bit better? I'd hope it would be a bit more. <laughs> Do you want to hazard a guess? Two stone? Three stone? Two? <laughs> Two. Three stone, three pounds. More than three oh, stone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is where it's really noticeable, eight inches down <laughs> around your belly. Wow. <laughs> six, six inches down around your thighs. Are you happy? Very happy, yeah. I'm so surprised by the weight loss. I was so surprised when he said it was three stone, three pounds. It was insane. Um, absolutely amazed. Like, I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near that at all. I think the experience has taught me not to be so controlling over what I eat and just be more relaxed. And it's taught me that I can eat a hell of a lot more than I thought I could. Next time on Super Size vs Super Skinny, the binge-eating bus driver from Bristol. When I look at myself in the mirror, I just see a real big, horrible, fat person. Who comes face to face with a fussy fast food eater. It's more feasible for me to grab a snack and run because I've got too much to do. Our four anorexics struggle with clothes shopping. When I see myself in, a, in an age 11 like this, it hits home how thin I am. And Anna Richardson goes running up tower blocks and gets lasered to within an inch of her life, all in the quest for perfect pins.